Greetings in the name of Jesus. We are in part four of the Revelation series. Now, my dear friends, I'm going to give you another introduction for the studies that we are going to undertake from now onwards. We have so far studied chapter one, for which we segregated three parts. So, part one, part two, and part three have dealt with chapter one. But from now onwards, I am not going to use the expression part, although I started by saying part four. The reason is, uh, if you deal with a subject of teaching part by part, each part has to be of the same length. Uh, only then would you know that uh, this particular part covers, say, for example, 30 minutes or 60 minutes or 90 minutes. We cannot deal with the book of Revelation in that manner. Why? Because from chapter 2 onwards, there are not uh, uh, information that we can cut into one particular time frame. But if we start dealing with a particular subject, then we have to start and finish it. Some subjects would take one hour. Some subjects more than that. Some subjects less than one hour. Uh, therefore, I will uh, call each of these sections segments. So today we are in our next segment of uh, starting to deal with chapter 2. And then in the forthcoming segments, I would refer to the foregone segments and the forthcoming segments and the current segment. Are you with me? Therefore, my dear friends, uh, I will now furnish a little uh, information uh, by way of an introduction pertaining to chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. Now, if you remember in part 1, I said that uh, the book of Revelation can be divided into two main sections. Chapters 1, 2 and 3 deal with the church age. Now, when did the church age commence? In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit descended on the people and they all began to be filled with the Spirit, speak in tongues and utter prophecies. Now that was when the church started. Now when does the church age end? When the church is raptured. We know that rapture is something that we find in the Bible. And in the forthcoming segments, we will deal with rapture in detail referring to Thessalonians and other passages of scripture as well. So, first, second and third chapters of Revelation deal with the church age. But starting from chapter 4, all the way to chapter 22, the book of Revelation deals with what is going to happen in heaven, on earth, after the rapture of the church. So, chapters 4, to 22 are futuristic. But we are going to now deal with chapters 2 and 3. Chapters 2 and 3 deal with the seven churches in the book of Revelation. In part, uh, parts 1, 2 and 3, I touched on the seven churches in which I said that there are three interpretations. All three are correct for the seven churches of uh, Revelation. Number one, the seven churches truly existed in Asia Minor, which is in present day Turkey, Istanbul. And today, the areas where the seven churches stood uh, are visited by a lot of people who would like to go and visit those places. And they can see ruins of the civilizations that existed in the first century at the time John wrote the book of Revelation. So interpretation number one, the literal seven churches. In other words, if chapter two deals with the church in Ephesus, yes, in Ephesus, a church truly existed and they were the initial recipients of the message to Ephesus. Then Smyrna, the place called Smyrna 
truly existed and there existed a church which became the, the initial and the original recipient of the message. So all the seven places truly existed where these churches truly existed and those churches were the original recipients of the seven messages given to those churches by the Lord Jesus Christ in chapters 2 and 3. <coughs> That's interpretation number one. Interpretation number two, which is also true, is the church age, as I said, from the commencement of the church to the rapture of the same, is divided into seven eras. Now, those seven eras are not equal. The first era uh, is not as the same size in length of the second era. The sizes of each era differs. But the seven <coughs> churches represent seven church ages. Now I will be explaining about these and I will give you historical detail pertaining to what transpired in those eras which uh, coincide with the messages of Jesus in these chapters. Interpretation number three. Almost every church, your church, my church, and every church, each church that existed from the inception of the church till the rapture, there are going to be many other churches uh, that will commence, that will spring up in the future, right? All right, when I'm talking to you, I don't know how many churches would be springing up uh, all over the world because churches are starting. And uh, all those churches come into this frame. Why? Because <clears throat> we are talking about seven churches and in a foregone uh, part I explained that number seven denotes completion. So the seven churches talk about the complete church and therefore the recipients of the, the, the third interpretation of the seven churches are every church. In your church, and in my church, we will have believers who uh, demonstrate qualities of the Ephesian believers. Some others, the believers of Smyrna. Some others, uh, believers of Pergamos. Uh, some others, believers of Sardis, Theotira, Philadelphia and Laodicea. All these seven churches are in some way, uh, through the believers, represented in almost every church and therefore my dear friends when we ponder upon these churches you too in a personal uh, manner evaluate your own self against what we are learning to see if you fit into any of these churches and uh, then take it on from there if the Lord is commending uh, that church, then that commend uh, uh, comes to you. And if the Lord is condemning uh, the church for certain things, then you may evaluate and say, uh, wow, I, I have those qualities and those qualities uh, deserve condemnation. So I need to repent. I need to change. And uh, there are promises. There are counselings, wonderful things that we are going to see in these uh, seven churches, my dear friends. Now, the messages to the seven churches follow a similar pattern. Okay, If, now I don't have a chart on me now, but uh, if you really want to study about the seven churches, through my teachings, of course, I'm not the only one who is teaching uh, the book of Revelation. Although many people say that Pastor Suresh's teaching is uh, quite touchy and appealing. I praise God for that, all glory to God. But I'll tell you, I have listened to some uh, teachers who are wonderful, absolutely great, much, much better than I. But uh, if you decide to sit and study, follow my teachings, I would advise you to grab uh, an A4 or a letter size paper and draw a chart so that you can you can easily identify let the chart have uh, seven rows okay seven rows to show the seven churches okay 
and then you can start writing the names of the churches in each of those rows. Now, give 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 yourself a lengthy uh, space because we'll have uh, a lot of not a lot, but uh, certain things to be written, and then divide the. Now you have seven rows to talk about the seven churches. Then you will have columns. Let the first column have the name of the church. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, all the way down to Laodicea. And then uh, I'm, I'm actually using my book here to refresh my uh, thinking because uh, I have written so far through th three books to uh, deal with uh, chapters 1 through to 3. And this book, Glory of Christ Revealed, deals with chapter 1 of Revelation. And this book, book 2, deals with uh, chapter 2 of Revelation, in which four churches are spoken of. And I have entitled those churches, The Busy, Brilliant, Beastly and Blurred Churches. And then, <clears throat> this book, book 3, deals with uh, the three churches found in the book of Revelation chapter 3. And I have entitled the three churches, the boring, benevolent and badly behaved churches. So it's quite uh, funny how I did it a number of years ago. And uh, some people have said, Suresh, we laid our hands on your book uh, simply because of the funny title you have given. Uh, the seven churches therefore are called by me as the busy, brilliant, beastly and blurred, the boring, benevolent and badly behaved churches. Ooh, a lot of bees, right? <laughs> now, <clears throat> in these books, my dear friends, I have given a lot of details that I will not be sharing here. Uh, one, because some of those things are boring when when you listen, for example, I'll be talking about how the Second World War began, how the First World War began, how the Cold War started, and then I'll be giving dates. I'll be talking about who signed with who. I'll be saying about Eisenhower. I'll be talking about Winston Churchill. I'll be talking about uh, Adolf Hitler, and I'll be talking about uh, certain conventions, Geneva Convention, and uh, the Warsaw Pact, and etc., etc. So some of those things like uh, on that day at about this time Hitler's army invaded Poland uh, things like that now I wouldn't be talking about those things here because it then uh, would uh, leave you bored uh, why, why do we need to know but my dear friends if you really want to lay hands on these books now by the way this is not in any way an advertisement uh, but if you contact us then we would be very happy to send you a book uh, I'm not selling, and um, if you if you wish to uh, place a donation, then that's entirely up to you. But this is not. I'm not going to behave like uh, some television evangelists who who say, okay, for a uh, for an offering of ten dollars or a donation of twenty dollars, we will give you this plus that. No, 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 no. If you want my books, simply contact us, give us a mailing address, and we will mail it free. Not because I have too much money, but because I, this is a ministry. Okay, this is a ministry. Now I think uh, the, these have no, the, these are no, lo no longer in stock. But now that I'm teaching the Book of Revelation onto video, I'm sure many people, many of you are going to contact me. So I better get uh, some printed and keep uh, <laughs> handy to to mail them to you. Okay. Again, I remind you, I'm not selling these. You can have these copies absolutely free and uh, if, if, if only you feel like giving an offering, then wonderful, praise God. Um, uh, now, I'm going to follow certain things in these books, my dear friends, just w with uh, chapters 2 and 3. When I step into chapter 4, I'm not going to use any of the external material, but I will be giving you loads of information from the Bible itself. Of course, I'm teaching from the Bible, but then I have written. So why not I peruse through the book uh, for, for, for your favor to help you. Okay, so now we have a chart, right? Seven rows. Column number one would be uh, the name of the church. 
And uh, column number two <coughs> would be the speaker. Now we know that the speaker is Jesus. Okay, the speaker is Jesus. How do we know the speaker is Jesus? Now let me read Revelation chapter 2 verse 1. Okay, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. I'll come back to that in a minute, okay. Now let's talk about the giver, the speaker. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Who is this? We saw him to be Jesus in chapter 1. Here is the golden lampstick. We saw that Jesus stands right in the middle of the candlesticks. So who gave the message to uh, the angel of Ephesus? Jesus. Verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These things say the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Who? Who is the first and the last? And who was dead and is alive? Jesus. Remember, this is Jesus, not the Father, not the Holy Spirit. Although in Trinity we know that the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit are one, they are three persons. The Father did not die on the cross. The Holy Spirit was not buried and he did not rise, rise, rise again from, from the de dead. Although the three personalities are one, we believe in one God. He is in three persons. Remember in part one I explained how John was uh, giving greetings to people from the triune God, separately from the Father, from the Holy Spirit and from the Son. On the same token, I want you to know that in the book of Revelation, the Father's function is quite different to the function of Jesus, which then in turn is different to the function of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, my dear friends, we know that uh, the, the, the giver of the message to Ephesus is Jesus. And here in Smyrna, we see that they also receive the message from Jesus. Verse 12, church number 3. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Again, that's Jesus. We're referring back to chapter 1. All the seven churches show Jesus as giving uh, the messages to them. And Jesus is depicted with the description found in chapter 1, which we have studied in part 3. And we are also going to look into semi-detail when we deal with each of the churches. Mind you, I'm still giving you the introduction to the messages to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Church number 4, verse 18, And unto the angel of the church in Theatira write, These things saith the Son of God, which hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. We know that is Jesus. Church number 5, chapter 3, verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Who was that? Who was having the sevenfold spirit on him and the seven stars on his right hand? Jesus. Church number 6. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, verse 7, right? These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Again, Jesus. And the final church, church number 7, verse 14 of chapter 3, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. You see that? The giver of the messages to all the seven churches is none other than Jesus. Jesus gives the message to those 
uh, churches to the angel of the church I'll come to that in a minute but at the end of the message the Holy Spirit does something look chapter 2 verse 1 to 7 you see the message to the church in Ephesus but look at verse 7 he that hath an ear let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Wow. Now, verse 1 says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith, uh, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lamps, candlesticks. Friends, the recipients were the, the, the whole congregation of that church. And that is why the Lord is giving to the angel or the shepherd of that church. But what Jesus gave to the Ephesian church, the Holy Spirit takes and gives to all the churches. Not to everybody, not to every individual, but for, for he and she who is willing to hear what the Holy Spirit says. Wow, wow, wow. Hey, I'm too excited. Aren't you excited about this wonderful thing? The Lord Jesus is giving to an individual church a message. Okay, The Holy Spirit is taking that message and he's giving the message to all the churches. And he says, look, just because I'm giving to all the churches, I'm not expecting every one of you to listen. He who hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And that was an expression that was used in the ancient uh, Jewish tradition to show a teachable attitude. Those who are willing to take on board what the Holy Spirit is saying. So we saw in verse 7 that the Holy Spirit is taking the message given to Ephes Ephesians by Jesus and is giving to all the churches. The same goes with the second church, the church in Samana, the message of which is found from verse 8 to verse 11. Look at verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Plural. The third church, Pergamos, the message is found from verse 12 down to verse 17 of chapter 2. And look at verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Church number 4. The church in Theatira. Verses 18 down to verse, verse, uh, verses 18 to 29. And verse 29 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Church number 5, the epistle to, the, the, the message to Sardis, right? Verses 1 through to 6 of chapter 3, look at verse 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Church number 6, Philadelphia, chapter 3, verse 7, all the way down to verse 13. Look at verse 13. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Church number 7, the church in Laodicea. Verses 14 through to verse 22. And look at verse 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Wonderful, isn't it? Wonderful, right? The, the, the Lord Jesus is giving these messages to each of the local churches and then the Holy Spirit is taking those messages and is delivering them to all the churches including my church and your church. We are the church. We are part of the body of Christ for we are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We are the church. So the Holy Spirit is taking every one of those seven messages and giving to us. And therefore, every message that we find in chapters 2 and 3 belongs to us because the Holy Spirit is giving it to us. So we don't have to say, 
oh, that's not for me. That's only for the church that existed in Ephesus. Yes, that was the primary, uh, that was the primary purpose why the Lord gave uh, the primary recipients the message, but then the message is ours. Coming back to our chart, seven rows, the, the, the first column would have the, the name of the church, Ephesus, Mana, Pergamos, on and on, all the way to uh, Laodicea. And in the second column, you can uh, write the, the description of the giver. Although we know that the giver is Jesus, he is described in different ways. Now, I will explain that. Now, I am the father of a little girl called Misha. She is 10 years old. And when I talk to her, I talk to her as her father. I am a pastor. I am the senior pastor of the Mount Carmel Church. And when I talk to my church, I don't talk as the father, but as the pastor of that church. And I am a brother to uh, my two siblings and when I talk to them I don't talk to them as a pastor as a father but as a sibling and I am uh, the principal of Mount Carmel Theological College when I address my students I do not talk to them as a pastor as a father as a sibling but as the principal on the same token the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to Ephesus as somebody. And he, when he talks to the church in Samarna, he does not talk as the way he talked to the Ephesians. He talks to them in a different way. To the church in Pergamos, in a different way. To the church in Sardis, in a different way. And when we read the description of Jesus as the giver of the message, then we can comprehend the mood of Jesus when he talks to them, right? Now, when, when I talk to my daughter as the father, it's the father's mood. When I talk to my people as the pastor, it's the pastor's mood. The moods change. On the same token, when Jesus was talking to the seven churches, his mood changes. You know, to some churches, he was talking angrily. To some churches, he was talking benevolently, kindly. To some churches, he was talking with frustration. And to the seven churches, Jesus talks in seven different moods. So your second column should have the giver and uh, against each of the church, we are going to write the mood of the giver by way of how he is described in the initial verses. So that's column number two. The speaker is introduced. Column number three is, you can entitle it commendation, commendation. To those churches, Jesus starts with a commendation. He's saying, I appreciate you. You're wonderful. You have done this. And during the course of our study, you're going to be surprised that there is only one church that he doesn't commend. Okay? No, no, no. Let, let, let me, if you know it already, then you know it. But uh, as for me, I would like to leave it as a semi-paradox till we start dealing with that church. Okay? So, yes, Jesus is commending six churches out of seven. So, leave a column, okay, leave a column uh, entitling it commendation. That's column number three. Now, column number four, uh, condemnation. He who commends the church also finds some flaws within the church, okay, some flaws. And he's condemning them. And uh, there are two churches of the, of the seven churches which don't receive condemnation. And again, if you know it, then you know it. Uh, but if you don't know it, uh, wait patiently till I uh, come and explain to you two out of uh, seven churches do not receive any condemnation. Nonetheless, you'll have the fourth column entitled condemnation. Now, column number five, right? Counsel. 
the Lord is counseling. I mean, he's counseling. I mean, he's not condemning to, to discard them. He's not uh, telling them off and kicking them out. But he's saying, okay, now I want to give you an advice. Repent or do, do this or whatever. Okay. So that's a counsel, counseling. That's column number five. And column number six, you can, you can write the, the secondary recipients or how, how can we put it? Because that's when you are going to see what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches. Now Jesus is talking to those literal churches. But the Holy Spirit is taking the message and he is giving to all uh, the churches. So let's uh, leave a column, column number uh, six, to see what the Holy Spirit has to say. So we'll say what the Spirit saith. Okay? And then column number seven is reward. Reward. Now Jesus is giving a counseling, okay? He is condemning, he is uh, commending and then he is counseling. And if those who take on board what he counsels uh, and also what the Holy Spirit says, then there is a reward. There is a reward. So uh, column number seven could be uh, reward, okay? And then somewhere in between, uh, maybe, maybe you may want to ha add another column uh, towards the end. Just write down the church era. Remember I told you that all these seven churches uh, speak about seven church eras starting from the inception of the church till its rapture. And I will explain. You can, you can leave a column, column number eight if you like, to show what church era does the efficient church represent. What church era does the Samana church represent? And uh, so on and so forth, all the way to the church in Laodicea. And uh, automatically the church uh, era of Ephesus should commence with the starting of the church. Uh, until when? I'll come to that eventually. And the church in La Laodicea, the last church, uh, started at some point. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that when we talk about the church in Laodicea. But it should go all the way to the rapture of the church. And if you are going to uh, sit and study revelation from me through these uh, videos, then you, I advise you, I, I, it's not advice, I humbly request from you to make a little chart of seven rows and eight columns and start filling in, 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 in your own little way, in uh, short, to see what uh, uh, the seven churches, uh, the messages to the seven churches mean. And then I believe eventually it could become a great blessing to you. And if you are a Bible teacher, if you are a pastor, uh, you can go ahead and teach. And if you have the chart handy, uh, that'll, uh, that'll be wonderful. Now I taught the book of Revelation to my students uh, not too long ago. And, uh, and the assignment for chapters 1, 2 and 3 that I gave was making a beautiful big chart on bristle board uh, for them to keep it lifelong. And uh, they have done a marvelous job. Wow, what pretty charts they came out with. And I was so impressed, you know, huge charts and, you know, the columns and the, the, the colored, they used different colors for each of the columns and rows. And uh, very impressive. Some students had done, of course, everyone did a wonderful job. And uh, some uh, of their charts were outstanding. Uh, they, th those charts were not done in English. Uh, I could have shown you the charts, but uh, they were done in uh, Tamil. And uh, I was impressed. So my dear friends, I encourage you to do those charts. Uh, so my dear friends, when we start studying, I will be talking about uh, uh, the church, number one, and the recipient, uh, uh, number two, uh, not the recipient, uh, the, the church is the recipient and number two I will talk about uh, the speaker Jesus how he is uh, described and then uh, thirdly I will talk about the commendation he gives fourthly the condemnation he gives to the church 
and fifthly the council and then sixthly what the Holy Spirit says to the churches and what does he have to say and then seventh uh, the reward for the overcomer uh, the reward for the obedient and then number eight uh, column eight I said you can have uh, <coughs> the church era the date are we ready I don't know how long I have uh, spoken. I would like to ask our cameraman, uh, Brother Ramesh, uh, how many minutes? Make a recording. Recording. Cut Karandi. How many minutes? Oh, 40 minutes. Okay. So my cameraman say, tells me, Brother Ramesh tells me that we have uh, uh, <laughs> we have been here for 40 minutes. But that's the in introduction for chapters 2 and 3. And I am now ready to start my message about the first church in the book of Revelation, the Ephesian church. And I have called that in my book, the BC church, the BC church of Ephesus. Now, chapters, uh, chapter 2 verses 1 through to 7. And let me read, let me read the whole message first and then we'll go uh, in detail. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, uh, and uh, for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou re repent. But this thou hast, uh, that, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That's the message to the Ephesians. Now in my book, I am explaining about the city of Ephesus. And I think I have given about one, two, three, four pages talking about uh, the city of uh, Ephesus. And uh, I don't need to tell all of that. I said, I told you some of those things are interesting to read. But then if, if it is boring, you can just flip the page. But then to listen to those would be boring. Now, I would like to just tell you uh, that the city of Ephesus was the most richest city uh, in those days. How? The people who lived there were all rich people, elite people. Now, if you look at the, the churches in the book of Acts and in the, in the New Testament, all the churches, especially the ones which received epistles from Peter, I have a different study altogether, nothing to do with the book of Revelation, of the seven churches of Paul. Paul also writes epistles to seven churches. The church in Rome, the church in Corinth, the two epistles to the church in Corinth, and to the church in Galatia, the church in Ephesus, again, like our church here, and the church in uh, uh, Philippi, and the church in Colossae, and two epistles to the church in Thessalonica. And uh, I have a different sermon about uh, the, the recipients of uh, Paul's epistles. And if you look at all those churches that we see in the book of Acts, uh, in the book of Revelation, and in the Pauline epistles, there were two rich churches, Corinth and Ephesus. The church in Corinth was rich not because of uh, the education of people or 
the, the higher level or the higher class of the people but because of uh, the because of tourism uh, Corinth was a harbor city so a lot of ships came a lot of tourists came and the king's highway uh, went along Corinth so there were so many uh, travelers and traders uh, there was a lot of foreign money involved and uh, that is why uh, that was why Corinth was rich but Ephesus was the, the other next city uh, not because of uh, any foreign income or trade or anything of that sort but the people who lived in Ephesus were the rich class of people perhaps the, the lawyers the, the doctors the engineers all the high flown people lived in Ephesus and uh, we see in Acts chapter 19 how the gospel reached Ephesus and uh, people received, some people who received uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal savior brought all their books and they burnt them in Ephesus. A lot of things transpired in Ephesus. And our man here, the, the writer of the book of Revelation, John, uh, was also the bishop of Ephesus when he got arrested by uh, the Romans and was exiled into the Isle of Patmos. So uh, John also being the only uh, disciple of Jesus left alive in the uh, first century by the time of uh, writing of the revelation uh, between uh, say AD 90 and 100 uh, the people of Ephe Ephes Ephesus were very elite, busy and uh, a wonderful group of people. Okay? Right. And now let's see how the giver is described. Verse 1 says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. We saw in chapter 1 that Jesus has on the palm of his right hand the angels of these churches. And I said, Angelos there, the angel, does not mean the celestial being, but refers to the shepherd of the church and Jesus has the shepherd of the church on the palm of his right hand and he himself is standing right in the middle of the candlesticks to show remember I told you when we were dealing with uh, chapter 1 that the Jewish leaders the rabbis always stood in the middle the leader always stood in the middle and Jesus by standing in the middle of the candlestick shows that he is the boss, he is the leader, he is the head of the church. So Jesus is standing in the midst of the candlestick talking as the leader of the church having the shepherds of the church, churches on the palm of his hand. And every one of these messages commence by saying to the angel of da 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 to the shepherd of and the and that shows the method in which Jesus would like to convey his message to the church although i believe that the lord can talk to us individually he does he does through the word through dreams through prophecies you know he has the prerogative to talk to us and the lord can talk to us in many ways okay and you my dear uh, brother and sister my dear friend you may have experienced uh, the Lord talking to you okay now there are so many people who would say pastor uh, the Lord talks to me through dreams wonderful the Lord talks to me through visions great the Lord talks to me through the Bible when I read wow the Holy Spirit teaches me amazing and uh, there are so many ways in which God talks to and through believers but he would like to use the shepherd to convey serious messages to the church which involve condemnation, commendation, counsel, advice, etc. etc. I am not saying that the Lord will not talk through believers, but I say that. The, the, the primary means through which the Lord would like to talk to the church would be through the shepherd, through the angel. If angel, not the celestial angel, but the shepherd. 
My dear friend, if you are a pastor of a church, you got to be extremely careful because you need to be sensitive to the Lord because the Lord constantly talks to you to deliver messages to your church. And every time you prepare a message, while I agree that we have to use tools, commentaries, encyclopedias, and uh, other devotional material, etc., etc., and perhaps uh, uh, the Hebrew, the Greek renderings of words, uh, word study, inductive study methods, you know, you do a lot of hermeneutics uh, in preparing your uh, sermon, but make sure that you listen to the voice of the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, who through the Holy Spirit which dwells in you will speak to, to, to you to convey a message to the church. Now what has happened to a large part of uh, church leaders in the world is that they are fully equipped with uh, a lot of tools to prepare messages. Look at me, my dear friends. I, not too long ago, a couple of years ago, started counting the number of sermons in my head and I came up to about 70,000. Now, I don't know how it all happened, but throughout my uh, preaching career, I have prepared message after message after message. Why? Because I studied in Sri Lanka, I studied in England, I studied in America. You know, I have studied and I have got a lot of degrees and it is quite easy for me to prepare a sermon. It is quite easy to prepare a sermon and deliver it. And that's the danger. That's the danger. We become so comfortable in preparing sermons and then we become so comfortable in delivering them. It's quite easy for us to be carried away with our own experience, our own ability, without relying on the Holy Spirit. And so people like us, pastor, must be very careful, my dear pastor. We need to, we may have the ability, we may have prepared sermons. Hey, you know what? I discovered that I have about 7,000 sermons that are yet to be preached. It is quite easy for me to go to some place and pick one of those 7,000 sermons and just preach. That's the danger. That's our danger. Because we have tools and today we have internet. My goodness. You Google things now. Many people can, hey, you know what? I am saddened by this. I'm not very happy about this. Uh, you can type sermon outlines on Google and then download outlines. Somebody has prepared sermons that you can just download and bash them you know, to, the, to the believers. And people are going to say, wow, what a sermon. It's okay. It's okay. You have the tools, you have the ability, you have prepared sermons, and you are well experienced in delivering sermons. But my dear friends, make sure that you listen to the Holy Spirit who will give you the word to your congregation from the head of your congregation, the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. We got to be hypersensitive sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The voice of the Holy Spirit is not too loud. He is a gentleman. He is not going to override our abilities, our tools, our experiences, but he is still there talking to us with that still small voice and we got to be extremely careful to listen to that voice and deliver the message he has to deliver to our church. So my dear friends, if you are a pastor like me, we have to be very, very careful. And to the other believers I would say, yes my dear believer, you are a man of God, you are a woman of God, God speaks to you and you listen to the word of God. You may be gifted in prophecies, in, in, in visions, in dreams, but your pastor is a man of God, is the angel of your church through who the Lord is going to deliver, deliver a lot of messages. So don't be proud. Don't be self-confident. Don't think, okay, I don't need to listen to my pastor because the Lord is talking to me. While on the one hand it is very true that the Holy Spirit talks to you and you are gifted, He is with you, praise God for that. On the other hand, you are a part of a church. You are a sheep who needs a shepherd 
and your pastor, irrespective of his credentials, abilities, uh, his uh, qualifications, etc., etc., is the shepherd through who the Lord would deliver his message to you, the sheep of God. Okay, my dear friends, I believe the Lord is speaking to you. And uh, uh, point number one says unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? And the giver is Jesus. Jesus is described here as the one who has the seven stars in his right hand and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So, Jesus is talking to the Ephesians not as anything else, not as the teacher, not as the encourager, not as the, the one who died for them, not, not, not as anything but the leader. He's the boss. The leader of the church standing right in the middle of the candlesticks and having the, the, the pastors, the, the, the shepherds on, on, the, on his right hand, he is talking to the efficient church. Now you have to, have to imagine Jesus as that authoritative head of the church. So he is not, uh, he is not in a cuddly mood. He is not in a mood where he is like, Oh my dear loving church, wow, you are nice. No, uh, neither is he an angered like, Hey you, Ephesians. No, but some something in, in, in between all the, you know, the leader. Hey, Ephesians, I'm your pastor. I'm your good shepherd. I'm the head of your church. And I have certain things to tell you. On that note, Jesus, on that uh, feel, Jesus is talking. Are you with me now? Okay. And uh, let's see how he commends the church. I'll leave my book and I will refer to it from time to time to help you. Uh, but uh, let's see how he commends the church. His uh, commendation, now in your column commendation, you can write verses 2, 3 and 6. Okay. Now let me explain these three verses. Number 1 is, I know your works. I know your works. Now, you are a working church. In my, in my book, I have uh, referred to Matthew 7, 22, where we find a group of deontologists, those who worked and worked and worked for Jesus and who come and tell Jesus, um, Lord, we, we, we worked in your name for you. We cast demons out. We prophesied, we did that, and we did this. And Jesus says, mm, I have not known you. And uh, so, we got to be very careful whether the Lord is truly happy in saying, I know your works. Remember, he is saying the same thing to the church in Samana. Now, in this context, I know thy works refer to the busy work that the church in Ephesus was involved in. But when we talk about the works in Smyrna, it was not the same works, the busy work that they did like in Ephesus. Wait till I go to the next segment where I will talk about the works of the church in Smyrna which was completely different to the works in Ephesus. But as now we are concentrating on the, the church in Ephesus, the works here the Lord Jesus is referring to connote the activities that they were, they were involved in. I'll explain. As I said earlier, the people of Ephesus were rich and educated. And they would therefore have everything done in decency and in order. Now the, the church in Corinth was rich but not educated and there was no decency and no order. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and the last verse, I think it was 40, says, let everything be done in decency and in order. 
Now that admonition was never given to the church in Ephesus, either by Paul or by Jesus. Why? Because they were a people who did things in style, in perfection. They were, by being an elite crowd, perfectionists. The church services started on time. Everybody was present before the church service commenced. And in church, they were all very awake, very orderly, very decent. They, they, they sang when they had to sing. They stood up when they had to stand up. Nobody sat down when they all stood up. And when they had to raise their hands and praise, they did that. Right? When they had to shout and praise, they shouted and praised. And they, in their quiet times, they were quiet. And when the sermon was preached, they sat and took notes and they were so awake and they, they listened. And boy, I'll tell you, some of the people who pastored the, the Ephesian church were, 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 were big guys. Paul was there. Timothy was there. And John was their bishop. So they, they had wonderful preachers, great ones. And they sat and wrote. And if you, if you happened to step into their church, you would not find a minute flaw in the order of service and the way they behaved. And the, the way they were attired to come to church, immaculate. Wow, you wouldn't see any rugged uh, clothes, any shaggy manner in which they came. No, 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 no. They were all very well prepared. They would get up early in the morning, uh, cook the meals, get ready and go to church on time. You know, and they go to church, they greet everybody. Hi, hello, how are you? Welcome. And they sat and, and they worship. Boy, Jesus is commending them for their excellence. It was an excellent church, mind you. Now look at how Jesus goes on to commend, okay? Number one, I know thy works. Number one, thy labor, hard workers, evangelism. They would get down to the streets and they would go and they would preach and they would, uh, uh, they would contribute tireless effort into the work of the kingdom. Be it preaching the gospel or organizing a program in the church. And uh, hey, now looking at my facial expression and my physical expressions and the, my tone of voice, can you imagine the type of uh, church we are talking about? A perfect church. Everybody would like to be a member of such a church. Why? A lot of programs, a lot of Bible studies, home meetings, home cells, and outdoor programs, evangelism, social programs. Hey, they were rich guys, weren't they? And uh, they could get, collect money and send for missions. And boy, I personally would be so happy to be part of such a church. Wonderful. And the labor and their patience. They were a patient group of people. They were not hasty. Now here the word patience is used uh, uh, as an antonym to, to hasty. They are not overexcited. They are not like, ha, who, ha, ha. They are not that type of a people. Very patient. If they had to organize uh, an evangelistic program, they were not hasty. They would sit, plan, decide, and when they launch the program, the program would be 100% fruitful, effective. Why? Because they are patient. And when they sit and listen to sermons, they don't need to uh, show a sign to the preacher, stop, we need to go home. No, no, no. no. They were patient. They were patient with the Lord. They were patient in things. So yes, they were hard workers in terms of uh, church activities and they were very patient people also. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Yeah, they did not tolerate evil. If somebody had a, 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 a sin or a problem or something that need to be dealt with, they would not um, allow that in the church. They would bring the person to the leadership and they would deal with the person. They, they cannot tolerate evil. In, although they were happy to have people, uh, unsaved people come to the church, 
they can come but then they need to change they can't uh, they cannot allow allow their sin to come into the church leave sin away you need to change we will not tolerate evil and look at this and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars how we are living in an age and era my dear friends that every dick tom and harry is willing to call himself an apostle a prophet oh my word when i when i see some people who hand me visiting cards i am shocked to smithereens to see the number of titles these people hold reverend doctor prophet apostle evangelist and there is no space to write their name and after their name they'll have b a b d m a d d d m i n p h d boy before and after their names they have so many titles and degrees amazing but sometimes some some of those people come to me and uh, try to uh, get my pulpit to preach and try to try to get me to come and minister to them uh, but i am very careful i am like these efficient people i would want to know okay if you call yourself a reverend who ordained you now in uh, europe what happened was this my dear friends a calamity happened uh, in sri lanka there was a 30 year old civil war so during the civil war many people fled the country uh, to europe and some other countries so there are so many sri lankans living in europe in america in india in africa in uh, korea and many parts of the world as a uh, traveler to these places i sometimes come across these people quite unfortunately these tamil people who went to these countries and got saved have become pastors uh, not through any procedure now to become a pastor of a church you got to have procedures if you read the books of timothy and titus those three epistles are called by us the pastoral epistles first timothy second timothy and titus there the holy spirit through paul is giving us the guidelines as to how a pastor should be how an elder should be how a, a, a deacon should be but when these people went to these foreign countries and they got saved and through their exuberance their excitement and the impetus they got through their salvation they came into the ministry and they did not undergo any formal training or they were not under any proper leadership and uh, there are uh, so many hundreds of self uh, acclaimed self appointed pastors prophets and apostles unfortunately they don't fit into the criterion at all while i believe that the holy spirit can call anybody to become anything in the church and the holy spirit would empower them i believe and i see in the bible that a formal system of training and appointing is there in the bible the lord has clearly outlined as to how people should be chosen into the ministry how they need to be appointed into the ministry you remember what happened in acts chapter 6 the grecian widows were not uh, treated properly when it came to uh, eating at the tables and the greeks murmured against the jews uh, for the greek uh, di- the the greek widows who were suffering what did the apostles do the apostles told them hey it's not our job to look after the tables we have to pray and teach the word you choose from among yourselves seven people who are full of the holy spirit and who have a good rapport with the people who have a good report of well mannered behavior among people bring them to us we will lay our hands and appoint them to be deacons over table serving at the tables 
and uh, people like Philip, uh, people like Stephen, the first martyr, were among those seven people who were appointed even to share, even to distribute food at the table, a decent manner in which they were appointed was followed. How much more for a pastor? How much more for an apostle? How much for more for a leader who is responsible uh, over many people? How much more? Now Paul. Paul was called by Jesus in an amazing way. Look, I was not called uh, the, the same way Paul was called. I don't think many of you uh, could say, yeah, 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 the Lord met me the same way he met Paul. Paul was on his way to Damascus to, to, to persecute the churches and uh, the Lord Jesus appeared to him. It was a huge shining light and Paul, who was Saul at that point, fell off the horse and he became blind. And the Lord said, you go and I will send you somebody. And the Lord simultaneously spoke, spoke to a man of God called Ananias. And Ananias came, laid his hand on Paul, Saul and prayed and he received his sight. And then he went to Arabia for three years. Now, there are speculations as to why he went to Arabia. Some scholars believe, like me, that he was uh, receiving proper training to be an apostle because he had to unlearn a lot of things that he had learned as a Pharisee, um, as a former leader of the Sanhedrin council before he could uh, embark in the ministry of the gospel. Uh, he came back to Jerusalem, he showed himself to uh, James and then, uh, then uh, in Acts chapter 13 we see that um, when, when they were all praying, the Holy Spirit spoke to the church and said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the ministry that I have called. And then uh, they separated uh, uh, Saul, is Paul, right? I'll call him Paul. Paul and Barnabas for the ministry. And then uh, Paul started uh, ministering unto the Lord. Now Paul did not step into the ministry the day after he got saved. It took at least three years before he could venture out in the ministry to which the Lord had called. Okay, so there, there should be a time of preparation for somebody to become a man of God. Yes, the calling is there. In 1979, when I became a Christian, the Lord not only spoke to me directly to say that he will use me as a pastor and a Bible teacher all around the world. My pastor, Pastor Bosco Gunavardhana, who died in that same year after baptizing us. Um, now his death had nothing to do with our baptism by the way, he was a wonderful man of God. He told me that the Lord told him that, that I will be used by God all around the world as a Bible teacher. And that happened in 1979. I wanted to become a pastor the next day. And when my mother and when others told me, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. You have to study your, I was a school going child at that time. You have to finish schooling and then go to a Bible college. And I was like, come on, the Lord is going to come. And the Lord has called me into the ministry. My pastor has told me what the Lord told me in my heart. So I have double confirmation that I'm called into a ministry and my mother and all these other people who were posing obstacles were seen by me as antichrists. I thought these were devil's stooges because they are, they are stopping me from becoming what the Lord wants me to become. But if it took eight years, it took eight, seven years rather, before I actually became a full-time minister. It was in 1986, February the 10th, that I became a full-time minister. Seven years. And in those seven years, the Lord prepared me. He took me through the mill. Boy, I'll tell you. Now today, if you know me now, of, through my preachings, my teachings, uh, if you don't know me for a long time, you wouldn't know the kind of path that I traveled to come to what I am now. I was, ooh, I underwent a humongous training, arduous, tumultuous, 
very painstaking process to become what I am now. I didn't know English, I didn't know Sinhalese, I didn't know the Bible, I was not studio centric, I was not a studying person. I cannot sit and read. I, I was somebody who hadn't done my A levels. I ran away from my home and a very bad guy and it took years for the Lord to make me, change me, mold me and I'll tell you he's still in the business of doing that with me. And uh, it took a long time before I could become a pastor. Yet another long time I could become a Bible student. How many Bible schools have I gone to? People tell me, Pastor Suresh, the Lord is talking to us through you. You are a wonderful teacher. You don't use notes. You are just talking. It just flows through you. I'll tell you, praise God for the calling that he has given me. Praise God for the talents and the abilities he has given me. But on top of the calling and the talents and the abilities and the experiences that I've obtained, the training. For three years, I was a full-time student at the Assemblies of God Bible College in Sri Lanka. And I really praise and thank God for Dr. Colton Vikram Ratna, who was my principal, for uh, Pastor Elfidj Fernando, who has gone to be with the Lord, my dean, his wife, uh, dear lady who, who, <laughs> who had to go through a lot of trouble molding uh, people like me, Sister Ayla Fernando, and uh, their son, uh, Pastor Johan Fernando, and then Pastor Willie Chelaya, who is right now the principal of that same school and uh, his wife, uh, Sister Sandra Chilaya, and for Pastor Freddy Pereira who taught us, he has gone to be with the Lord, and Pastor Ian Viravardana who taught us theology, who is in uh, Australia now, and Pastor Simon Fuller who taught me the initial letters of Greek. Today I am reading my Bible in Greek. I have, uh, uh, I have uh, finished my advanced Biblical Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic and Akkadian in year 2000, but, but um, uh, he was the one, Pastor Simon Fuller was the one who taught me Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta and, and uh, uh, a lot of other teachers whose names I don't, uh, I haven't uh, uh, time to mention, Pastor Vernon Pereira and uh, many, many, many great men and women of God were used to train me to, to become what God has called me to become for three years. Those dear people at that Assemblies of God Bible College had to suffer to, to train a guy like me. And then I went to England to study. And in England, I, I, I studied for three years where I suffered. And I, I, you know, if I, if I talk about the suffering that I underwent in England, of course, people know me as uh, uh, somebody who God began to use in England. Yes, but prior to that, the kind of life I lived and mercy was with me at that time going through all these troubles and persecutions. Today many people see Suresh as a building, a rising building, but the foundation that the Lord had to dig was horrendous, very painful. And my dear friends, that is what is needed for a man or a woman of God, a good foundation. And to, to, to be used by God powerfully. You need to allow God to dig our lives and, and eliminate those uh, rubbles and rubbish away from our lives and put in His word and His gifts and His talents into us and then use us. Ephesians were very particular in people who come and call themselves apostles. If people came and said, I am apostle so and so, the Ephesians would shake hands and say, yeah, but can we have a word with you? And then they would ask questions. They would test them. Who appointed you as apostles? What knowledge do you have of the Lord Jesus Christ? How much of the word do you know? And I'll tell you, from then to now, so many people lied of their ministry. Even today, there are so many people who con, who lie, saying that they are pastors, they are apostles, they are this and that. My dear friends, Jesus is commending the church in Ephesus for testing, for trying. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. My dear brother and sister, 
if anybody is teaching to you through the television, if somebody is teaching through the YouTube, if somebody is writing a book and you got your hands on, on, on a book, however attractive the teaching may be, you got to be very careful to see whether that person is a genuine apostle, a genuine teacher or a genuine man of God. Who is that person associated with? Who is that person uh, representing? Of course, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, that, that's one thing. But what sort of a church does he come from? What are the dogmas and the doctrines of that church? You've got to be very careful. On that note, I want to tell you where I come from. <clears throat> I was ordained as a minister in 1986. I was given license. I was licensed as a minister in 1986. And I was ordained in 1991 by the Fellowship of Free Churches of Sri Lanka, which functions under Act Number 47 of 1975. It's a recognized parliament uh, uh, lawfully recognized by the parliament and our church the Mount Carmel Church and the Mount Carmel Theological College are oh, recognized or affiliated by the Fellowship of Free Churches of Sri Lanka. I am ordained by them and I am also an executive member of their executive committee and I am an executive pastor of Sri Lanka recognized by the body of Parliament recognized church. We need to have a solid background. We need to come with a recognized body. Who made me a pastor? Who called me into the ministry? Who laid hands on me? Look, Paul says to Timothy, treat not your anointing that you received simple. Treat not your anointing that you received by the laying hands of the apostles small treat treat not it small for that's huge because people have laid hands on you and i say as i said earlier do you know what happens to many of these sri lankan people who have fled into many countries and have become pastors somebody some individual would come from india or sri lanka and that individual would lay hands on that person and call that person reverend from that day. Many of those people don't have the basic biblical training. Many of those people have never been under senior pastors. N many of those people don't know the doctrines of the Bible. Many of those people don't know to outline what they believe. It's sad. It's sad. Now don't tell me that the Lord is gracious. We are living in the period of grace and the Lord will use them. I believe that the Lord would use anyone. But we got to be very careful as to who we are listening to. Who we are part of. There should be decency and order and organization. Jesus is commending the Ephesians. Wonderful. You are trying the people. You are not just buying everything that people are just telling you. You are trying and you are exposing the liars. My dear friends, we need to expose the liars. And uh, I did a series on the book of Jude to my church. It took five weeks, five Sundays for me to start and finish the book of Jude, which is just one chapter. Do you know what the, the entire book highlights upon? Exposing the false teachers. The Christians have an erroneous view of Oh, we'll pray. We'll pray about it. Yeah, there is a heresy. Even in our church, some people hold on to that heresy. But let's pray. Yes, that's wonderful. But the Lord is expecting us to take action against liars. Both in the book of Jude and here in the book of Revelation in verse uh, 2 of chapter uh, 2. Where it says, and you have found them liars. Expose the liars. If they are not properly ordained, expose it. You are not an ordained pastor. Don't come to me with your, uh, your abilities, your talents and your gifts. God will give. Hey, if you are a believer, 
you will be given a gift of the spirit, right? But just because you can prophesy, just because you can uh, see dreams and God can talk to you through uh, dreams, visions and prophecies, doesn't mean that you can get up and become a leader of the church. There is a procedure, there is a responsibility, there is a training involved and a proper way of ordaining you. Ordination is very serious if you read the books of First and Second Timothy and Titus. And uh, Jesus is uh, commending them. Verse 3, And has borne and has patience and for my na name's sake has labored and has not fainted. They were, they were uh, an ardent people. They, they, they were constantly eager. They were so enthusiastic. They did not lose the fire. They did not lose the fire. They, they, they were not lethargic. They did not start something uh, with uh, fire and then eventually let lethargy uh, enter in. They were an exuberant people, very enthusiastic, very bold, very active and a very happy group of people. And Jesus is commending them. And look in verse 6, he is commending them for something else. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Nicolaitans, that was a new heresy that was creeping into churches in the first century. The founder of Nicolaitans was Nicholas, one of the seven deacons appointed in Acts chapter 6. Wait till I go to the next segment uh, where I will talk about Nicolaitans. Okay? Now you remember this. Right now I am not going to talk about Nicolaitans except uh, to say that, that uh, the Nicolaitans were the ones who brought the, the divide between the priest and the lay people. The priestly and the laity. The divide. So they tried to say that uh, well, the, the pastor is supreme, he is above, he is supranormal, etc. So, uh, the divide between the priestly and the laity. Now, although I told you that the Lord uses the shepherd of the church to deliver the message to the people, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? That we sheep uh, have a shepherd to lead us and to guide us, to feed us and to protect us. But that doesn't uh, mean to say that the pastor is in any way superior to the believer. My dear pastor, if you are a pastor, you and I are not superior to any believer. If we sin, we sin. We need the grace of God over our life and our ministry, just as every other believer. And we have to pray. We have to read the word. We have to live our Christian life just as every other believer. And our Lord is our Lord just as He is the Lord of that believer. We are in no way superior to the believer. But we have a responsibility that the Lord has given us which He has not given to the believer. We have to lead them, guide them, feed them and protect them as their shepherd. That's a wonderful responsibility but that doesn't mean to say that we can't mingle with them we are superior etc but the Nicolaitans were teaching that and God hated that Jesus hated that and the Ephesians hated that and Jesus is commending the Ephesians for hating what he hates but wait till I get into uh, another church where they entertained Nicolaitan, Nicolaitan teaching and uh, let me talk about that in detail okay my dear friends now I'm through with the commendation of the Ephesian church. Now let's go to condemnation. Okay, verse 4. Nevertheless, but, you're wonderful, you're efficient, your labor is great, wow, but, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. I have one thing against you. Because thou hast left thy first love. Oh la la, you have left the first love. I want to show you something here my dear friends. And uh, I, 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 I have written in my book uh, as to what, uh, 
what what happens here when talking about the fall here he says because thou hast left thy first love in the king james left the greek word is pepto which is not just leaving but falling the same word is used in first corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 wherefore let him that thinketh he stand, standeth take heed lest he fall. The word pepto is used there. Okay. And uh, if you can read 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 through to 11, you would see that this fall, pepto, means to backslide. Mm. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to tell you here. I'm trying to tell you here that the church in Ephesus, albeit their exuberance, enthusiasm and their impetus in the word of God and their hard labor for the propagation of the gospel and their care and the carefulness towards the leadership, lest anybody become apostles Jesus is saying you are a fallen group of people Ugh. can you see that oh, with all these commendations he says you are fallen you, 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 you have fallen into what into sin pepto pepto that's why I said if you read first Corinthians chapter 10 then you will see that fall really means to fall into sin not just lower your standard a bit no 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 it doesn't mean lower your standard or a little less of what is expected of you. No, no, no. It means to fall into sin. Sin of what? Losing the first love. What? So did the Ephesians stop loving the Lord? No, 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 no. Love versus first love. And the love, the word love here is agape, okay? Because there are other words to denote love, like phileo and uh, eros. But this is agape. Now my dear friends, the Lord Jesus here, through the message to the Ephesians, shows that although he likes your labor, your preachings, your wonderful arduance or to work for the Lord, your exuberance and your enthusiasm, etc., etc., he is more interested in your love for him. You remember, I would like to draw your attention to one other book written by this same guy, John. Turn with me to John chapter 21. We know that Peter had uh, denied Jesus three times and uh, having seen Jesus twice after Jesus rose again from the dead, on the same day that he rose again from the dead, and then eight days later when Jesus appeared to them to show, forth, show him to Thomas, Jesus didn't uh, show himself after that. And then uh, they were all despondent and uh, Peter decided to go fishing because after all he was the only married man and uh, that speaks for itself, doesn't it? He was married and perhaps his wife told him, wife was nagging, hey, you know, you said Jesus, but then he appeared to you, but then where is he? Now you can't do this, you have to start doing something and perhaps uh, it was the reason why he reverted back to fishing. Okay, uh, verse 1, chapter 21, I'll read this. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Okay, seven people. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately and they and that night they caught nothing. Right? But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. Nah. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. 
they cast therefore and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved John right said unto Peter it is the Lord now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord he girt his fishers coat unto him for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea he just jumped down and the other disciples came in a little ship so they were not far from land but as see to were uh, 200 cubits dragging the net with fishes okay as soon as they were come to land they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid there on and bread Jesus did not even borrow any fish from them up until that moment he had other fish and bread already on fire as soon as they were come to land they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread Jesus saith unto them bring off the fish which ye have now caught bring your fish also I have my own fish bring your fish also Simon Peter went up and drew the net uh, to land uh, full of great fishes you know how many and hundred and fifty and three wow and for all there were so many yet was not uh, net, net broken now those of you who have been to Israel would have eaten a, a fish called Peter's fish around the Sea of Galilee. There are some nice places there in Magdal and in some other Tiberias and, and uh, Kafir, near Kafir now. Uh, nice, right? They're huge. No, huge in the sense, not, not huge, huge. But they're quite big. To have 153 of them in a net, wow. Now, uh, Jesus saith unto them, verse 12, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that he was written, risen from the dead. Now verse 15, listen to this. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than this? Now you may think that the answer of Jesus, uh, Peter would be, yes. I'll read. He says, he saith unto him, Yeah, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. My dear friends, you may think that uh, Peter was asking, telling Jesus, yes, I love you. No, my dear friends, the answer was really no. Because Jesus uses the word agapao, agape. Okay. But then uh, Peter is saying, Lord, you know that I phileo thee. You know, phileos. Not the agape, but the phileos, the, the brotherly love. Oh, not, 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 not the brotherly love, but, but love between brothers, friends, uh, parents and children, that sort of a love. Not the unconditional agape. Agape is the unconditional uh, divine uh, love uh, of God, you know. So he's using the, the, the verb phileo. Okay. Now, Jesus said, okay, feed my lambs. A small responsibility. Verse 16, he saith to him again the second time, Simon son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Ya Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. I'll explain. The second time, Jesus asks him, Are you sure you don't have that agape love towards me? And Peter goes on to say, mm, No Lord, all I have is the filial love. And Jesus says, mm, Okay, now I just have you guys with me. And it is through you guys that I have to start the church and run it. What can I do? You don't have uh, agape love. Nonetheless, I have to give you the responsibility. At least you have the phileos love. And verse 17, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? At that point, Jesus was using the word phileos. Meaning, okay, now you say that you love me. Uh, with phileos love have you truly got that at least and that's why the Bible says Peter was grieved because he saith unto him the third time lovest thou me 
Peter was grieved not because P Jesus kept on asking but uh, he used the word uh, uh, phileos uh, against phileo against uh, agapao right are you with me I'll explain and he said unto him Lord thou knowest all things thou knowest that I love thee Jesus said unto him feed my sheep let me explain this my dear friends the reason why I reverted you to an earlier book of the Bible to John chapter 21 is to show you that the prerequisite to serve the Lord is love it is out of love that we must serve the Lord okay we may have qualifications we may have experience but it's the love that we need to have to be able to serve the Lord P Peter comes there and Jesus is asking Peter hey do you love me with your ag with agape love and the answer of Peter is you know that the love I have for you is the phileos love in other words he's saying no I don't have agape love but I have phileo love to give you and then Jesus says mm, okay in that case you can feed my lambs a small responsibility but then again he asks are you sure Peter that you don't have the agape love for me and Peter says, you know, no Lord, maybe people rem Peter remembered how he denied Jesus three times. So he's saying, Lord, you know, I don't have agape love. All I have is filial love. Then Jesus says, mm, okay, you feed my sheep. And after a little while, Jesus is asking a, a, a question in a very pathetic way. You know, Jesus was very helpless because I, I only have you guys to run the church. My job is done. I died and I rose again. Now I have to ascend to heaven. And now I have to send the Holy Spirit. And the church has to start. And the church has to run till I come and rapture the church. So I just have you guys. So Jesus is asking Peter, Hey, now you say you have phileo. At least do you really have phileo? That's what Peter was upset about. He, he was grieved because he was sad that Jesus was asking at least whether do you have Phileo and Peter says you know that I that I have Phileo in a true sense and Jesus says okay 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 feed my sheep my dear friends let me tell you something if you look at the life of Peter from that moment onwards till the day he died the Bible doesn't rec record his death but we know historically that Peter was crucified in Rome and when he was going to be crucified he says he said to them I don't want to die like my master put my head down and my feet up and crucify me upside down historically Peter was crucified and killed in Rome up, crucified upside down in other words from this moment onwards in John 21 till he died Peter demonstrated an agape love to God although he said I just have phileo love but many Christians of today say Lord I have agape to you I, I love you you are my everything but the way they live shows that they merely have the filial love my dear friends I believe the Lord is talking to us he is interest, interested in our love for him that's what he wants he doesn't want performers I was a musician a singer and a lead guitarist before I came into the ministry and uh, I had uh, won awards for my music and my songs and my lead guitar playing and when I came to the Lord do you know what I said I said Lord I'm a musician I will sing for you I will play musical instruments to you like David did and I'm going to become a worship leader you know what the Lord said no I don't want a performer I want somebody who loves me and he does not use me as a performer I don't perform except in isolated situations when I pick up a guitar and sing and praise God but that's not my main ministry and I have learned to love the Lord in a crazy way right I still have to develop that love in me and I believe that's the what the Lord is saying to you too you can perform we can have program after program as I said look at the Ephesian church everything was fabulous everything was organized they were very busy 
their labor was commended. They were so excellent people. They were patient. They did not tolerate apostles. Everything was wonderful. But everything happened as per program, not because of the love they had for the Lord. And the Lord says, I like what you do, but I don't like why you do. You do because you are used to it. You are performing. I don't want performers. I want those who love me. The Lord love, wants love from us because he loves us. His love for us was unconditional. He initiated in giving us the love. And he in return expects that kind of love from us to him. And it should be love, the premise on which we should establish our ministry and our functioning in the Lord. The arduous nature, the, the, the busy nature, the, the endurance that we have, the patience that we have will become null if we don't have love. That's what the Lord is talking about here. My dear friends, do you love the Lord the way you loved him the first? Now if you tell me, how, how can I know whether my love for the Lord is true? Compare your love with your love that you had for Jesus when you first became a Christian. I have to compare my today's love to the love that I had for the Lord in 1979 when I was willing to give up Hinduism, when I was willing to give up my family, when I was willing to give up my life when I was persecuted and tied on that tree and beaten. I, you know, do I love the Lord the same way that I loved him in 1979? It's very easy, my dear friends. Remember when you first gave your life to Jesus, what made you give your life to Jesus? How much of love you had for Jesus? And now compare today's love of yourself to Jesus with that which you had on the day you got saved and see whether your love has escalated or dropped. If it has dropped, then the Lord says, you have fallen, you have fallen. If you don't have that first love, you may not be committing sins. You may not be, be committing adultery, idolatry, murder, etc., etc. But you have fallen, the Bible says. Now, let's go to the next point. The next element in this message is the counsel. In your chart, you will have a, a column called counsel. In that, you may want to jot down what I am going to say now. Verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. The two words you need to note here are remember and repent. Now what does the Lord Jesus want us to remember or the church in Ephesus to remember? Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. The, the, I, I explained the word uh, fall means to, to, to uh, fall into sin. Now for Jesus, a, a believer losing the first love is just as falling into sin. That's how serious he takes love. Why? Because Christianity is founded on love. Christianity is based on the immense feeling called love. Initiated by God. God is love. And God has given us love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay, So love is the, the, the humongous important feeling originated within God. And the Lord has given us the love. All he wants in return for his love is our love to him. Now what did the church of Ephesus do? They gave back something for the love that they had received from the Lord. And what they gave back was works. Works and love. Now Jesus doesn't uh, condemn the works. He, 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 he says wonderful. I know your labor, I know your patience, you are great guys, your programs are impressive, wonderful. But, he says, you have lost your first love. 
It's not just any love that I want. I want that first love. And my dear friends, I know I don't have to explain to you the first love. The first love is one of its kind, right? Now we may have loved somebody uh, the first time we saw and that love which, which gushes from deep within us. Now that first love is what the Lord Jesus wants. And he says, remember, therefore from whence thou art fallen. Now remembering how we loved the Lord is not a difficult thing. Why? All we have to do is to retrospectively uh, think of how we loved him when we got saved. In my case, it was in 1979. We are not talking about the medieval period. We are not talking about uh, the, the period before Christ. We are talking about our life. Now, I don't know how long uh, uh, have you been saved. Perhaps 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Now, that's not something that you can't forget. I'll tell you, whenever you became a Christian, that was a big thing, right? Can you forget? If you forget how you got saved, then, then I, I, I have a question about that salvation. Did we really get saved? It is not. Becoming a Christian is not another program in our lives because that's when we are born again into the kingdom of God. Our old man died and a, a, a great change happened in our life. So to remember how we loved the Lord with our first love is not a difficult, arduous task. So he says, remember. Therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent. What does the word repent mean? Turn around. Turn around and go back to where we first loved him. Usually we use the word repent in two contexts. Context number one, when we receive Jesus in our lives as our personal savior, the first time we become Christians, we use the word repent uh, to denote a 360 degree turn. And the second context in which we use is when we commit sin, repent. But in this case, Jesus is saying, repent from your current love for me and go back to that first love. He is not talking about a lovelessness. He is not saying, oh efficient church, you don't love me anymore. And today's message for you is not that God says you don't love him, you love him. But what he says is, is it your first love? If not, repent, repent and go back to that love. Now don't ask me how, because all we have to do is to forget about our programs for a minute and start to, to remember how, he, how we loved him in that day when we accepted him as our personal savior and come back to him and say to him, yes, Lord, I truly love you. When we repented for the first time, when we became Christians, remember the things that you said? No, I'll tell you the things that I told him. I told him, Lord, wow, Christianity is wonderful. I don't know much about Christianity, Lord, because hitherto I have been thinking about Christianity as the white man's religion and you as the white man's God. But now I see that Christianity is wonderful. You are splendid. And Lord, I want to denounce all my 330 million gods. And I want you to become my God. I accept you alone as my God, Lord and Savior. And I would denounce every God. I would denounce my culture. I would denounce my tradition. I would denounce the things that, that gave me pleasure so far. Because from now on, you are my everything. You are my pleasure. You are my love. And, and, and those are the things that I told the Lord. And the Lord wants to hear it yet again. Not from your lips, but from your inner being. You would never forget the way in which you repented for the first time and accepted the Lord as your personal savior. So try to remember and, and, and then just take your time. Sit back, close the door or go to a wonderful park or somewhere and just talk to Jesus. 
and tell him how wonderful he is and how him coming into your life has changed your life and tell him the kind of things that you would denounce for him. Let him be your only pleasure. Let him be your only purpose for life. Let him be your everything. Okay? Now that's what the Lord is saying. And do the first works. Again, here he's not talking about the programs and uh, the works that the church does. But the first works, such as uh, smiling at Jesus, uh, you know, looking at Jesus and, uh, you know, the, 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 the way you, you just expressed your love, denouncing the things that, that gave you pleasure so far. And, uh, you know, do the, the first works that you did when you got saved. I would, um, the, the first things that I did when I became a Christian would be to get the, the little uh, pocket Bible that they gave me and I started reading the Bible. I understood nothing. I understood nothing. But it was so wonderful. I just kept on reading and reading and reading although I didn't understand. You know what? When they gave me a little New Testament, what I read was the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. And would that make sense even to a mature Christian unless the Christian really knows about the genealogy of Jesus starting from Abraham all the way to Joseph? And now, I was a new Christian and these names were quite foreign for me because I was a Hindu. Hindu names are completely different. Now, if you come from a Western country like a European country, America or Australia, then you are familiar already, even if you are not a Christian, even the non-Christians who, who live in Europe and America, they are familiar with these names like Jacob, James, uh, Jacob, Joseph, uh, Abraham. But for a Hindu to have come uh, from a totally strange religion into Christianity, these names were difficult to pronounce. And uh, nonetheless, I found a joy in pronouncing those, trying to read those names. And uh, I'll beat uh, uh, the, 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 the non-understanding that I had uh, uh, over the Bible, I kept on reading. So that's one of my works. And then the, the, another thing was I was just talking to him, which is, which is prayer. The, one of the problems that we have in our Christian matured life is that uh, when we grow, we think too much about prayer as to how formal it should be and how, uh, how much of a standard our prayer should demonstrate. Whereas, when we first became Christians, we didn't know how to pray, but just we spoke to Him. We just talked to Him. In a church service context, when you get up to pray for something, there you need to use your words uh, carefully, uh, choice of words, the tone of voice and the longevity of the prayer, these things come into consideration. But when you are talking to Jesus personally, just talk the way you talked to him when you first became a Christian. Just tell him anything. Tell him anything and everything, how you feel about him, how you feel about life, how you feel about yourself. You know, that's what he's saying, prayer. And, and, and then uh, reading the word. And uh, one more thing is going to church. You know, when I first became a Christian, although I found the church to be a very boring place. Wait a minute. I was a Hindu. Hindu temples are very attractive, colorful and eventful. When you go into the temple, uh, you'll hear a lot of music, you know, the drum, the the melodious instrument and then you'll see people wearing uh, stylish dresses and the smell of the flowers and the incense and all the idols that are painted in different different colors and uh, for me to have come out of that into Christianity when I went to a church in 1979 it was a very uh, boring place just a hall with some benches and a pulpit but I craved going there because that place was wonderful and on Sundays I couldn't wait uh, for Sundays to go. Now look, being an immature Christian, a new Christian, I was not yet into church politics. Okay, I didn't care who led the worship, I didn't care who preached and I didn't care whether the preacher used hermeneutics, homiletics, etc, etc. Uh, I didn't care the worship leader 
uh, wore white shirt or brown shirt or how the people responded uh, to prayer, how the people got up and shared testimony. Everything was wonderful for me. When people one after another got up to share the testimony, I would just look at them and I would be so happy. Wow, Jesus has done something to them. And then when they sang a song, Maybe the song did not have good melody. You know, those were not professional singers who sang. But remember, I used to be a professional singer. I, w I used to be a professional singer and a musician. So for me, church, professional music was absent. But I enjoyed it. And when the pastor preached, I didn't care how he prepared the message, uh, whether the message was from the Old Testament or the New, whether he used the proper transitional statements, examples, etc. Et I just enjoyed everything. So these three things, prayer, reading the word and going to church were very interesting uh, for us. And I believe, I believe, my dear friends, when Jesus says, uh, do the first works, these are the three works. Prayer, reading the word, and going to church. Now, how are these three in our lives? And I believe that the Lord wants us to do those three things in the way we did them when we first became Christians. Prayer, reading of the word, and attending church. Yes, we do these three things in our lives now. But it is time for us to sit back and think, evaluate how our prayer life is. Has it become a formal must-do category thing in our lives? And uh, therefore we have formalized it and we pray in the morning, in the night and when we eat. Uh, or is it uh, like in our first days of Christianity, just talking to God? Ooh, all the time you think about God and talking to Him. That's what he's uh, talking about. And reading the word. Are we critical about the word now? And are we uh, reading it in a very formal way? Okay, let me see which parts I understand. Or are we choosy and picky? Uh, do we read portions of scripture that are appealing to us, that are comfortable to read, that are easy to comprehend? Or are we just craving to read uh, the Bible from anywhere? Even those uh, difficult to pronounce names, difficult to understand passages. Now that's how I read the Bible, I remember. And there is no difference between you and I. When we first became Christians, we would want to read the whole Bible from wherever, right? Whether we understand or not. And then attending church. Are we attending church with... Uh, preconceived ideas and uh, you know when we go there we are skeptical we are critical uh, about the worship the selection of songs about the sermons and now that we have grown in the Lord we know how church services should be etc etc my dear friends some of those things are good organized prayer and disciplined way of reading the word and uh, attending church with the, with the idea of how a church should be uh, conducted, etc. They are all good. But then the Lord Jesus is expecting our first love and for us to just uh, do the works of uh, those first days yet again to demonstrate our love. There was another thing that I did when I first became a Christian. I would grab tracks from the church and I would go and I would distribute tracks and uh, in, in, in the public, on the streets, in the buses, in the train. Sometimes there was another friend of mine called Yoga Raja. He and I would get into a train and we would start distributing tracks from one compartment to the end. And then we uh, reach another train station get off and get into another train that comes the other way and then distribute tracks and that was fun. Yes, people people scolded us and uh, people uh, disliked it. Of course, you know, Sri Lanka is a Buddhist country. Then and now preaching the gospel in any form is difficult. And uh, so it was not an uh, interesting thing. It, we did not distribute tracks because it was interesting or, or because people responded. I mean, I, I remember people, you know, crushing the paper and throwing at our face and tearing them right in front of our eyes. And 
the, 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 the thing, the work was not pleasant, what was not interesting. But the passion we had in those first days to, to share Jesus was so much that we grabbed every little opportunity to share Jesus. And uh, we spoke about Jesus, we spoke about uh, uh, salvation to anybody. If we traveled by bus, the person next to us, would uh, we would just get into a conversation and then we'd start to share Jesus. Now that first love is what the Lord Jesus is after. Now you know, you know how you uh, felt the first love for Jesus and how you demonstrated that first love. Just Jesus is expecting you to revert to that. Of course we love him now, but do we love him uh, the way we loved him when we first became Christians? Now he is in that council gives, gives us a, a little uh, warning. He says, or else I will come unto thee quickly. Now this time, this coming quickly is not a positive uh, uh, thing here and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Now a lampstand, a candlestick, when lit up, it has to be kept on the wall, on a candlestick or on the table on a candlestick. For without a candlestick, the lamp would not stand. It will fall. When falling, it will stop giving light. And we know that uh, uh, the fire, the light, denotes the word of God. Okay. Uh, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the Lord Jesus is saying, you have the word of God in you, but if you don't have your first love for me, I will come and remove the candlestick. Therefore, the word of God that you have will not be able to shine. You will lose your light. Now, light does not merely have to be the word of God. It can mean many other things from the Bible. It can be the glory that you have as a Christian. It can be your sin, uh, uh, sinless testimony to others. You shine Jesus to others. You remember how the Lord says in Matthew 4, uh, 14, you are the light of the world and that is to show Jesus. And uh, we will lose all that light. And what is the use if we lose the light? Because Christianity is a faith of light. We are the children of light. When, we, when Paul talked, when, when Paul talks about uh, intermarriage between Christians and non-Christians, he says, what is, what is the link we have with, between light and darkness? So, so we were in darkness, we were brought into light. Peter says, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation that has been brought into light from darkness. So we are the light, okay? The, because we are living in light and we are to show light to others by way of testimony and witness of Jesus Christ. And we are the possessors of the light, the word of God. And the Lord Jesus says, if you don't have your first love, I will come and remove the candlestick or the lampstand and you will lose your light. You will become useless. That's what he is saying. Okay, now to next, the reward, the reward for those who take heed to the counsel of Jesus. Verse 7, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I will, to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now we know that in the Garden of Eden there were two trees. The tree of life and then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Scholars differ in interpreting these trees. For some, they are merely metaphorical subjects. The two trees didn't really exist. In one of my sermons from Genesis chapter 3, I am explicating how that tree was a real tree. We don't know what tree 
it was could be an apple tree a mango tree we don't know but it was a real tree which the devil caused eve to look at and commit disobedience commit fall into sin and there was another tree the tree of life that was in the garden of eden and uh, now the lord says it's in paradise now the word paradise means a beautiful garden it has uh, a persian origin but then uh, the lord jesus used it used it on the cross remember when the thief said lord remember me when thou comest in your in thy kingdom uh, uh, jesus says uh, thou shalt be with me in paradise today jesus used the word now paradise is not necessarily heaven but then paradise is the place where those who die in the lord go and rest we must understand four places the heaven the paradise the hell and hades okay now heaven okay heaven or heavens hashmaim then paradise paradiso and then hell gehina and uh, hades okay sheol we must understand that these four places do exist two places are not yet open during the course of our study in revelation we will learn about heaven and hell both these places are not open to the public yet in heaven god and his angels dwell and in hell nobody is there the fire is still it's all ready but nobody is in hell those who die in the lord go to paradise those who don't die in the lord go to hades now what happens to hades at the end will be discussed in our study when we reach revelation 19 and uh, the paradise the, for the people or the souls that are in paradise we will talk about it when we reach chapter 4 okay at this moment what you would what i would want you to remember is that the paradise is not heaven but paradise is where the people uh, who die in the lord go and rest but also in a future tense a future connotation the millennial rule of jesus is followed by a big war which is followed by the new heavens and the new earth and the new heavens and the new earth also has the idea of a garden the earth is going to be like a paradise okay so here jesus is saying this he is saying to him that overcometh uh, he will eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of god this is a metaphorical sense in which he is saying that this person is going to be in heaven in paradise and in the new heaven and the new earth are you with me this is in a way the promise of eternal life to us who get back the first love in our lives we will end up in heaven and we will live eternally with god that's all now don't ask me what happened to the garden of eden where there was the tree of life uh, where was uh, the garden of eden and uh, before closing the study of the church of ephesus in revelation 2 i would like to brief that now many people have uh, ideas uh, that uh, the the garden of eden was somewhere in israel so somewhere in iraq and even here in sri lanka you know when the early muslim traders arab traders came to this country they saw this country to be a beautiful place and they were the ones who initiated that this must have been the place where adam lived so when sri lanka was called tabrobane and when the arab merchants arrived they were the ones who suggested that because in islam also they have a garden of eden and they have uh, adam and hawa adam and eve uh, so they suggested that uh, sri lanka would have been the garden of eden 
and therefore there is a mountain in Sri Lanka which is called Adam's Peak. Okay, now that's all wrong. Some people believe that uh, the Garden of Eden was somewhere in Iraq or Iraq for Americans because two rivers, Euphrates and Tigris, flow through that country. And uh, those are the two rivers, two of the four rivers found uh, in the Garden of Eden in Genesis. Now my dear friends, that's not true. Because when God made the earth, he caused the water to come to one place and the dry land appear. And therefore there was only one continent and one ocean. That was how the first world of Adam and Eve was. Okay. Until the rain came. When the rain fell during Noah's days, the water was the water that God had separated. Remember, he said, let water be divided from water and the expanse appear in the middle of the waters. So there was this water above the expanse that we call sky and that water was in the form of a, a hydroxide layer along with the ozone layer and uh, that water was there and that is why it did not rain because the sun rays could not penetrate so uh, deep uh, onto the earth to be able to evaporate the water which needs to happen for the formation of clouds which in turn would give rain. So because of the hydroxide layer around the globe there was no rain on the earth and God during the deluge of Noah caused that water to come and fall as rain and that's how the water rose 23 and a half feet or 15 cubits above the tallest uh, mountain on earth namely the Everest in the Himalayas and uh, therefore after that the Lord caused a wind to blow and when that wind blew water was separated to the north and to the south forming the North Pole and the South Pole Arctic and Antarctic and that was when the five continents and the five uh, oceans came into existence. So how, where the Garden of Eden was and how the first uh, uh, pre-Delugic world was is quite unknown. It's uh, impossible, completely impossible thing to discover how the pre-Noahic world geologically existed. And therefore discussion about where the Garden of Eden was is something that is uh, not possible. It's it's simply a, a tomfoolery to suggest that it existed in Israel or Iraq or Sri Lanka or anywhere. And therefore we needn't discuss more about the tree of life uh, which was there in the Garden of Eden. I believe the Lord took it away from there and put it in paradise. And I don't know how paradise looks and how what happens in paradise. And I'm not uh, 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 in... I'm not a, a big supporter of those people who come and say that they saw paradise in vision and etc. etc. Of course, I believe that they could have seen some vision about Jesus um, etc. But then I, I don't believe in what those people come back and say that they saw heaven, they saw paradise, they saw hell, they saw uh, Hades etc. Uh, because they are not biblically substantial. Now, Therefore, today, my dear friends, all we have to do is to uh, remember that if we don't have the first love, then we are going to miss the paradise. Now, we have, uh, we have uh, a, a crooked belief that once we become Christians, we will end up in heaven somehow. But what, what, what the Lord Jesus suggests here is that, no, 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 if you are to taste from the tree of life, which means the eternal life with the Lord in heaven, that you need to have your first love. And uh, without getting into further theological discussion on that matter, because that is not within the perimeters of what we are talking about here. I believe in this long study of today. Boy, I'll tell you, compared to parts one, two and three of this series, this segment 
uh, has taken well over two hours and I have just discussed only chapter 2 verses 1 through to 7, the first church, the church of Ephesus. In our next segment, I am going to be talking about uh, the church in Smyrna. So, get your chart handy and uh, come prepared for the next, next segment to fill in those little gaps with the detail that I am going to furnish uh, pertaining to the church in Smyrna. So, my dear friends, do you think that the Lord is talking to you through these little uh, teachings? And uh, at this point, I would want to tell you that um, a lot of prayer has been invested in producing the, these uh, videos. A lot of people are praying and I have spent a lot of time praying and preparing for this. As you see, I am just talking because I am so much full of this information which I want to download. And uh, I would want to tell you that if you are listening to me for the first time, uh, that English is my third language and I have to think in Tamil and translate whatever I say. And uh, bear with me, bear with my lingo, bear with my expressions. Just learn the book of Revelation. And if any one of you feel that you belong to this kind of uh, a category, uh, 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 an Ephesian church person, then uh, think about yourselves and e evaluate yourself. Uh, yes, our works are all fine. Jesus is commending our works, but he's not interested in works as the way he's interested in our first love for him. Develop that first love yet again to Jesus. And it's not difficult because we have shown that love when we first became Christians. Okay, my dear friends. We will wind up for now and in our next segment, I will come with the message to the church in Smyrna. God bless you.